Um, welcome everybody uh, to our league's lecture, lecture series. Today we're going to do our first installment of our Meet the Specialist. And one of my favorite specialists is joining us today, Dr. Seth Waite, uh, who in addition to being a, a, a faculty at the University of Michigan, uh, an assistant professor in transplant surgery, he is my mentor and my good friend. Um, he completed medical school at the University of Toledo when I was migrating to the United States as like, high, like after high school. So if that doesn't make you feel all old, Seth. Boy. 2009. <laughs> Um, he finished, uh, he completed residency and uh, general surgery residency and transplant fellowship here at the University of Michigan, and then was kind enough uh, to stay with us forever and ever. Um, he um, completed a two-year research fellowship during training, like I have explained to you guys a lot of residents do during their um, uh, clinical training in general surgery. Uh, with a focus on education, also clinical outcomes. Um, he is part of our faculty right now for the past two years, and is going to tell you today a little bit more about himself and about transplant surgery. Val, thank you. Um, this, I, I am like, since, since I got the invitation to be part of this, been super duper excited um, for this hour. I think it's the best hour of the week, um, for sure. And I want to hear as much from you guys as you hear from me, because I, as I'm going to tell you, I'm not that interesting um, of a person. Uh, but I think the job that I got lucky enough to find my way into is a super interesting um, and, uh, as Gabriel said, sort of life-changing opportunity that I get to be a part of every day for the patients. Um, and so I hope you'll feel free to ask me questions as we go. Ask me anything about it, lifestyle, um, you know, having a family, doing this, doing this job, whatever comes to mind, and, and um, we can go from there. So Val asked me a few questions. The first one was some background on how I came to, to be part of medicine. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know if I really have a great answer for that. I come from a family who has no physicians. Um, my mom was a teacher, and my dad, uh, he treats metal, so very far from the medical sphere. Um, I played a lot of sports and I worked during the summers baling hay and actually worked as a plumber for a couple of summers, which taught me to hook pipes together without leaking. And as I'll tell you, uh, getting two pipes together without uh, the, the help of platelets and uh, clotting factors is a lot harder than, um, than a blood vessel, which has those extra things. <laughs> uh, so spent a lot of time doing that. And uh, sports was a huge part of my, my uh, sort of development. So I played a lot of basketball and then eventually started running track where uh, I came to the University of Michigan to run track. And during that process, I really liked, uh, you know, liked the sciences as we all do. And um, eventually just decided that I wanted to be a doctor. And I don't really know that I had a good sort of lightning bolt moment or an inspiration in that, in that quest. But what I really found that I love to do is help um, help people to feel better, and I, I felt like I was okay at that, so moved forward with that. Um, I, I really came into this whole process very naive about what it was to be a physician, what it took to be a physician, came to medical school and didn't recognize that you had to do a residency afterwards, which sounds a little ridiculous at this point after nine years of, of training, but my wife and I were kind of like, <laughs> once we get done with medical school, like, it's all going to be awesome after that. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to start making the money and living the good life. Uh, and of course, then I discovered that you actually have to do more after medical school and, uh, and then started to kind of work, work my way down that road as a second year uh, medical student. For it's sure. really funny. Uh, you know, I didn't know, Seth, this is like a funny aside, but when in medical school in Colombia works different than here in the States, you come at it like right after high school. And I was, when I moved to the States, I was like, oh, like, I'm just going to like land and like, you know, figure out how to get into medical school. So I actually like was one step behind you. I didn't even know that you needed to do <laughs> grad before you apply to medical school. And let me tell you, it was like a really rude awakening when I, when I realized that it was going to be like five years before I could even apply to medical school. Oh um, man. Yeah. I know. And so it has, it, my my parents also didn't know and so like my mom always asked them like are you done yet and like the answer is always no yeah never be done so 
I, I'm curious to hear um, from you guys, uh, what, what was that driving factor to you in medicine? Was it like a, was it like a lightning bolt moment um, or was it because of, you know, I know um, I've heard from Jessica and Kelly about this a little bit, but I would love to hear, yeah, I'd love to hear everybody's story about kind of how they got interested in it. Um, okay. So yeah, for me, I guess at first I got into it really late. Uh, like I'm an openly gay person and ever since I've been exposing myself to like uh, clinics or uh, doctor settings, I've really noticed the lack of competency when it comes to physicians and uh, treating gender, minor gender minorities. Um, so yeah, basically I guess that my goal is to uh, bridge that gap between the LGBT community, physicians, and hopefully bring a more equal environment for everybody. That's so great. I, I love the fact that you come from a place where you experience um, something that you could make better and that, you know, and, and realize that that could be a, you know, a place for you to, um, I, I would assume, make it so the next generation um, can have a, you know, a better, more supportive environment to, you know, work through, work through whatever health concerns they may have. So that's, that's super duper cool. Yeah, many, for many, many, many patients. Uh, I've I've actually read about this and everything. It's, it's been pretty uh, written about that many people, many patients prefer not to even get treatment or go to the doctor in the fear of being um, discriminated. So I basically just wanna, and I personally know people that personally know them that they prefer not to go to doctors. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a super sad and kind of humbling thing to hear um, and I it's really really super cool Gabriel I can go next um okay. so I I guess what first drew me into medicine um was this experience I had when um my family and I we were living in Brazil and I had um we're kind of living um more like inland and um we didn't have like great access to hospitals or anything. And um, uh, one time, I guess I must have been like seven or eight, I got really badly burned on my feet. And um, my parents took me to the hospital. And um, I, I think it was just the first time that I was like, I remember being startled by something. Um, I had the first half of, I guess, my life at that point. Um, from one to six, I had spent in Germany and um, healthcare in Germany was never something that like really stood out to me. But um, I remember being surprised and shocked by the difference between Germany and Brazil um, when I got to the hospital at that point, just, you know, there there's like a line out the door of the hospital and people kind of just like, um, like sitting against the wall waiting to be seen. And there was one healthcare provider going down the line, like treating every person. And I just remember being really confused why why there weren't more doctors, why there weren't more like medical supplies, why we were outside and like um and then kind of carrying this like just all these questions when my family moved to Texas, and then seeing you know like so many more resources here than I'd ever before seen, and then kind of growing up in Texas um, as like my, my, an immigrant and, you know, my parents trying to speak English for the first time. And then all of a sudden me having to translate everything and just kind of seeing, I guess, the immigrant health experience um, as in general were, th were things that kept pulling me towards medicine and, mm -hmm. you know, kept making me really reflect on, on like as as I thought about like where I wanted my career to go just where I felt I could make the most difference and I I always came back to medicine cool um, so 
Uh, my experience kind of revolved around my parents. Um, growing up, my parents did not have any insurance. So seeing that as a kid growing up was kind of hard for me, but I did want to give a disclaimer. Uh, medicine was not my first love. Um, so growing up, I had uh, braces, and I actually wanted to be an orthodontist growing up. Um, but I, it was very hard to find a dentist to shadow. So one time walking in college, I passed a flyer, and it was like a, a volunteer experience at a hospital. So I ended up doing that. Nothing dental related, but anyway, I started like a volunteer at the hospital. Um, after it kind of made um, that and some family pressure, um, you know, living in a Mexican household, going to school for eight plus years isn't necessarily the smartest thing to do, according to them. Um, so I ended up switching to nursing. So I was pre-nursing for about a year, and then it wasn't really my thing. It was more of a, I guess, a family pressure to like do something quick and get my career started and you know have family and whatnot. Um, but over time, I think. Um, it just wasn't for me and like just being exposed to like a giant facility being in a hospital and seeing other people like kind of go through things within the hospital and then I was volunteering in Riverside which is predominantly um, you know minorities so I think one of the things that fueled me a lot was being able to use my Spanish and talk to patients in Spanish and it's crazy how open someone is when you speak their language and one of the biggest uh, conversation starters, usually they ask like, oh, where, where's your family from? And you name part of Mexico and somehow they have family there. And somehow somewhere you're like second cousins. I don't know, it's just, I'm exaggerating. But I think um, a lot of it really stems from like my family. Um, I think when I see patients at the clinic back here at school, I kind of see my, I see the patients through like the vision of my parents. And growing up, I really want to, one of my lifetime goals is actually going back to Mexico and um, to the Pueblo where my parents grew up and maybe like starting a little like uh, clinic for like free care and I guess traveling the world doing surgery. That's great, Robert. I, I think you and Priscilla both speak to this bridging, bridging the gap, you know, between um, uh, and, and being that source of um, coordination between you know, your parents and the healthcare system. It's really, really cool, for sure. Gracia, how about you? Uh, so I share some experiences with Priscilla and Robert in that um, as a kid, I played interpreter for my family going to the doctors. Um, and I definitely, I felt like it's interesting, even as a child, you there are so many things you don't pick up on, but you can definitely pick up on when someone is invested in you versus not. Um, and, you know, I had some good experiences with physicians and bad experiences, specifically like when you are a child and you're like the intermediate between the patient and the physician, like, the doctor, like if my mom was going to understand what was going on, I had to understand what was going on. And so I could totally tell when a doctor, you know, was willing to invest another, another few minutes and making sure that I understood and therefore that the patient understood. Um, and so that was definitely the first kind of, um, you know, experiences that made me realize like how much of an impact a doctor, a good doctor can have. Yeah. Um, then um, in undergrad, I like had, you know, I, I came to undergrad um, with a sense that I wanted to be a doctor. And so I kind of pursued um, a lot of opportunities that would give me that kind of exposure. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, so the other thing that I would say in terms of my interest in surgery, um, I came to med school thinking I would be a pediatrician, which in retrospect just means I knew very little about all the different <laughs> specialties. Um, uh, but, you know, ref especially writing about uh, my personal statement, I've done some reflecting on like what has drawn me to surgery. And actually in undergrad, um, I was a global health fellow at Yale. And so um, for my capstone, I did field work um, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and so I spent one summer there 
um, doing a needs assessment in a community. Um, call, they, uh, there are certain kind of communities called bates in the Dominican Republic. And so these exist like in different parts of the Caribbean as well. But basically um, the history behind them is um, there were a lot of Haitian immigrants who'd cross the border into the Dominican Republic and live in these kind of shacks and work in the plantations. Um, and that started in like the 60s, but basically these, they're like these um, almost like, uh, just like neighborhoods have grown around where these shacks used to be. And so a lot of Haitian immigrants still come to the Dominican Republic live in a lot of poverty, no electricity, no running water, um, and are socially kind of discriminated against because of their skin color, because they're immigrants. Um, and so I spent my summer kind of like living, living in that community and like talking to everyone about like what their health needs were. And one thing that really struck me was just like, which, which, you know, if you study like basic global health or public health, like you'll see that in a lot of developing countries, people tend to die from accidents, like like car accidents and stuff like that. Um, injuries are in the top 10 causes of death, whereas that's not the case in developed countries. Um, but I really just, I met so many people who either lived their life like suffering from a really basic surgical condition that could have been fixed or or dying from like at a young age from something that again like surgically would not be that complex um, and in that area um, uh, people would you know like American doctors would come and do like a like a clinic or something like that for a few days and there were always more patients that needed care than received care and so I just kind of realized a how much of an impact a surgeon can have in that kind of setting and be like that that also kind of planted the seed for my interest in surgical education um, because it's not super sustainable to have doctors fly in for a few days and fix things and then leave i think ideally like you would empower people to provide the best care for their communities um, yeah so. and, and a longitudinal experience too exactly. yeah, that's great yeah. that's great Jessica and Kelly, how about you guys? Sure. Yeah, so um, similar, I think when Robert was saying he didn't in initially intend to come into medicine, that, that definitely resonated for me. That was not my intention. Um, I started out uh, just like uh, similar to Dr. Waits. I, I went to college uh, to run track and cross country and um, kind of had a true athlete experience with that. Uh, and honestly thought that maybe I would try to pursue that long term um, and kind of realized along the way what I had like an eye-opening experience of what a gift education really is and and uh, that that was something that I wanted to pursue further after undergrad so I ended up going back to um, back to school uh, at that time I had kind of um, tangential interest in mathematics just as something that I found interesting and fun to do um, and entered into research mathematics uh, in a graduate degree uh, in Dayton, Ohio with Jessica. Uh, uh, she was in Dayton uh, as well. We went, we went out there for graduate programs. Um, and it was kind of through those opportunities of doing mathematics research, which uh, a lot of uh, graduate students are supported by teaching positions, that I fell in love with teaching and fell in love with service work and actually helping people and, and seeing the impact that uh, you could have on on um, people's lives from a perspective of like uh, understanding more about where they came from one understanding more about their background and trying to empower students really is what what i spent most of my teaching time doing um, and so I, I continued to pursue the mathematics degree because it was something i found personally interesting fulfilling and uh, ended up getting a phd in mathematics and during that time I started thinking about what can i do that's uh, additional to teaching uh, that's more impactful to, to teaching than teaching in like uh, in the realm that I wanted to pursue it. And so um, started shadowing uh, and volunteering in local ERs and hospital systems and just absolutely loved it. I felt like, you know, this is, those are the interactions that I was looking for. And um, 
decided to to continue pursuing it from there. And then in terms of uh, surgery, it was something that I, I felt like I came to medical school very broadly interested in medicine in general, kind of wanting to help people and, and um, you know, not really specifically interested in one specialty or the other. I actually remember entering uh, our clinical clerkship year uh, with the goal of saying, I'm going to take every rotation as if that's the specialty I'm going to do. Sometimes you hear that advice and it's pretty good advice to take. But um, as I went along, I quickly found that you know, the different specialties interact with patients in different ways. And there's very different uh, kind of time points in people's care that you can be impactful. And I found myself gravitating towards the surgical problems. I felt like they fit with how I like to think about problems. Um, I'm somebody who likes to, uh, my, with my math background, I think very geometrically. And so I really enjoyed the time in the OR. And I found myself just kind of obsessing over every little move that people were making that the surgeons were doing and thinking about the best way to do the anastomosis and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was, uh, felt like a really natural fit at the end of the day, um, just fit with the way I like to think about problems and, and in particular the time point that I want to be able to impact people's care. Um, and that's, that, that was, that was it for me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I love that idea of, you know, mathematics and geometry. We can go back to that when we talk about doing the transplant thing, but, um, it's, it's such a great yeah, one thing. Now I'm wondering <laughs> what you were thinking about me when you were watching me operate. Kelly. <laughs> Uh, how many mathematician surgeons do you know? It's pretty <laughs> sweet. Uh, that's going to be an awesome. <laughs> when you start writing an NIH grants, that's going to be a sweet story to leave with. Yeah, he loves that. He loves even like um, knot tying and his like thinking of new ways to tie knots. It's mm -hmm. it's not how I think. <laughs> um, I think for me, like a little bit of context, as everyone knows where Kelly and I are. Are married and um, we've known each other since fifth grade which we've been pretty lucky and I think if you would have asked us back then for sure if we'd probably be together or if we would both be in medicine and then both wanting to apply into gen like surgery no way like first well, first of all I didn't know what that was like back then and I think for me like thinking about it um, like I didn't really like my family we didn't know a lot about medicine so it's like I'm like first generation college and even with like our interaction with the medical field, my family, um, like Mexican family, it's more like you do not go to the doctor unless you're like dying is <laughs> not something. So it's like my mom and I joke about it now and that it's like you don't go unless you need to. Um, so I didn't really think about medicine growing up. But my one thing that my family, especially my mom, did for me that is really great. So she had me when she was like really young, um, but she always told me like, oh, you're going to college, like college, I would say she has a phrase like is where you belong. And so growing up, it was just kind of this expected thing that was like, okay, college is next. But my family didn't really know anything, um, which we always talk about too, is they were like, oh, my mom was like, oh, go to community college, like that's college. And I was kind of like, no mom, like I'm gonna go to a UC because I'm from California. And she's like, what, you're not gonna apply to a state college. So it was kind of a lot of, my family believed in me, but also since no one had done this, it's almost like self or it's doubt a little bit about pushing yourself. Um, so when I went to college, I had made it like that was right. I went to college um, and I realized no one really ever asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> so um, I went and I ran at Davis also, but I didn't go on scholarship. Um, Kelly did. And I was a walk on to run cross country and track. And I loved the team um, and the team, they just turned division one and so they were very focused on athletics it was very much running is your life and school is secondary um so for me i was like oh that's great and i didn't know anything i didn't know in undergrad that there was such thing as research i didn't know about like any um even like organizations it was just running was all i did um and i had a lot of injuries in in college so for me when i took anatomy I can't remember if it was my junior or senior year, but I remember that was like the first um, course. I just loved anatomy and it was taught by a pediatric, um, a pediatrician. And I remember, okay, I love anatomy and like, what am I doing with running? I love it, but it's not something long-term and what do I do next? And so I think for me, I really just kind of followed each thing I really enjoyed. And so I was like, I want to get my master's anatomy. I want to have my own anatomy lab and I want to teach anatomy. That was like my 
mm -hmm. career goal. Um, and so I looked at programs and there was a program in Ohio that was taking um, actually people at the time then. If, so I like interviewed over the phone, I got in and Ke uh, Kelly was like, hey, let's go to Ohio. Uh, <laughs> and we were like, from <laughs> I was like, cause I'm, I'm the only child, like my family, like, I remember when applying to college, like I said, my mom did not want me to go far. Like everything was a luxury. Like, oh, you don't leave the state. Um, so when I got into Ohio, in, in Ohio to Wright State, which is a small school, but um, I remember being like, that's really far. And Kelly was like, he didn't know his geography and he thought it was like Idaho. So he thought it was closer. So he was like, oh yeah, like it's not too far. And then we looked at the map and we're like, oh, it was really far. So we drove to Ohio. Um, and I think for me, it was the perfect, it was exactly what I needed at that time. So when I made it to like college for my undergrad, um, I did not focus on, on academics. So I didn't get the very best grades. And I think when I was there, maybe I had one thought of like, oh, a lot of my peers are pursuing like to be a doctor or to be things. And I think I always thought, um, well, I'm not good enough to, to do that. That's something that they're gonna do. And I'm just gonna kind of pursue something not that kind of grand. And so when I went to get my master's um, in anatomy, my like focus for my own personal goal was like, okay, give my academics like the full focus. And I really loved it. I, it was a perfect experience for me. Like the program was small, um, but I got to do teaching, did my first research, which I really enjoyed. Um, and it was very small research, but it was like slicing rat brains <laughs> at neurogenesis. And I, I fell in love with research. I was like, oh, I can, answer a question that no one has answered and I like anatomy so then um, a PhD was next but there's also because Kelly was pursuing his PhD in math and this time I followed him to Colorado but I knew I loved I'd always loved like exercise biology from like an athlete I feel like every athlete loves like physiology and like exercise so when we went to Colorado I got my PhD in integrated physiology which I really enjoyed and that lab does both like research and cells, mice and humans, and I say on the human side, but I realized like through their um, like different interactions, I love research, but it feels sometimes a little bit like abstract, like you're figuring things out, but you're not necessarily helping people. And a lot of my research participants would have different, actually like medical issues. And it like mirrored my family because I think a lot of people, if you're like first generation, like college, your family, doesn't understand the difference really between like science and medicine. So when they hear you're in science, they're like, oh, you're a doctor. And like, <laughs> you get the calls and I still get them. Like I got one yesterday. Like you get the calls of like, I'm, this is like, this is my symptom. Like, what do I do? Like, and it's like, I'm not a doctor, but your family like relies on you to kind of help them and figure out what's going on. And I was having some family stuff where I had to like fly out to California to help like, I think, like, Rossi was saying, it's, like, you get positions where you, which it feels like it's more than you should, like, as a kid or as, like, you know, not an expert, but your family relies on you to, to kind of take on, you know, that role to really help them, and that was happening at the same time, and I was realizing that I wanted to do more. Um, I wanted to be a, like, physician scientist, and I had a, a mentor there that kind of told me, oh, you should pursue medical school. Um, which was again like the next passion so I was like okay and I didn't know anything about like medicine and even though like in our PhDs like we came in we didn't know anything like we I think like everyone's kind of said you came into medical school and you're it's very different um, we didn't know anything about Michigan in terms of like medical school but I actually had two people in my lab came to Michigan like in the years before me so that's the only reason why I heard about Michigan um, and I think there's like Michigan Kool-Aid like everyone talks about it like it's so amazing but when you get here it it is you're on board with that um so we fell in love with it here and when I came in I had a little bit in my mind about surgery um but I think I, I've always I always like I think come a little bit from like some self-doubt so when I was thinking about like becoming a doctor I had first been like oh I can't like that's too like grand for me but when I was getting my master's in anatomy I TA medical students and I was kind of like huh like I can do this like I'm teaching them like I and so the same thing when I came into like Michigan I was kind of like oh a little bit like a surgeon but that felt very 
Um, like no one's done that before in my family and it felt very grand. And I have people that support me, but I still have family members that I think they mean well, but they're just not, you know, they've told me, and I've told them, I, I think I want to be a surgeon. They've been like, oh, don't reach too high. Like you don't want to get disappointed. Um, and it's something that's like a little bit hard when like no one's kind of done that before. But I think the support here has been great. And I've loved surgery. I really think like for the impact it has in patients' lives. I think for me, um, it's not just the operating room. I think a lot of people say, oh, you, you have to love to operate. And I think for sure, but I think I really also love the impact it has and like getting a patient to the operation and after. And really the, like a lot of people talked about, you know, they always say pursue stuff that makes you upset and especially with like research and the disparities um, in, especially when it comes to surgery, like transplant is something that, which Valeria knows because we are like very passionate about is like, it makes me upset. And I think it makes me upset. Um, people automatically say, oh, if you're interested in health disparities or working with those communities, do primary care. And I think that's a disservice in that, um, you know, access to healthcare is not just primary care. It's surgery. It's the, all these like procedures. And I think that's something that I'm really excited to be part of. Yeah. And I'm excited for this group because we all are like equally passionate. <laughs> nothing like being mad about things with other people right? like my favorite <laughs> clinical problems life problems uh you you I mean I, I've talked to said about this before I I mean I'm from like I grew up in like a rural area in Colombia and at some point like when I was little like I got into my head I remember I think it was because of the impact factor of me telling my parents I was going to be a brain surgeon and like, I always joke about how like, I have been like the same person, tell me part my partner this all the time. I have been like the same person, like my entire life since like inception. And so I was this like, very like spunky little person. And I was like, oh, I want to be a brain surgeon. Um, and then I like had no, I like I grew up in the middle of nowhere um, in a beautiful place without any research in a very Latino way. Like I did not go, to, I only went to the doctor for vaccines. So I was like, my mom like has never been an anti-vaxxer. It was like vaccine for everybody, but that was it. And I was like treated with like my, I, my mom is from one of like the native tribes in Colombia. So I was like treated with like herbal remedies my entire life. And I continue <laughs> to treat myself with herbal rem remedies as a PGY4 general surgery. I literally have like, I'm like growing herbs in my garden that I'm going to treat myself with. And so this idea of being a physician was like something that like came from like, the like the tale of achievement uh of like whether or not like what could i do to be able to not only support myself and support my family but also like make an impact in my community so to this day the place that i grew up like does not have a real hospital and it's like the second biggest city in the area in colombia where i'm from and people die all the time like i sometimes every time somebody comes to the hospital nowadays and i'm like ordering all these fancy tests and like feeling so smart I like think about like what would I do if I like didn't have all of these tools at my disposal and like the reality of like the lack of access the lack of access that I experienced um because of many ways the lack of access that like the my family continues to experience like I was uninsured until like medical school solid and my parents are still uninsured and so it is it has fueled like my transition from like high school to uh, undergrad to want to uh, like pursue uh, medicine. Um, and I got into medical school in Colombia. I graduated like at 15 and my mom was like, no, you can't do that. So then I immigrated to the States and I remember still going in because I found out that you couldn't just, well, I found out about the whole college thing. That was a surprise. And I was like, okay, so I guess we'll get into college. And then when I tried to get into college, I was like, well, I guess I will finish in Colombia. You only do up to grade 11. Um, uh, and so you have to here you do an extra year. So the paradigm before like maybe 20 years ago was that you will come when you immigrated with a high school degree from like anywhere in South America, you will come to the stage, you'll finish your last year, catch up on your English, then speak in English and like apply to college. And apparently something changed before I came and they were like, oh no, no, you're gonna go to college. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm going to go to college? I don't speak any English. And so for like a solid like six months after I immigrated to the States, I was like, I remember I placed in like some reasonable level of math and like the lowest level of English. 
So I started on my community college and I remember every time I would come to like my counselors in my community college and I was like, well, I like the thought is to go into medicine. They'll be like, wait, 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 wait. So I was like, just take it easy. Like it's, this is like the, like the road to medicine, which is like long, treacherous, like final fantasy type of adventure. And I like even remember when I thought about applying to college and I went to one of like the like bilingual counselors that were like, well, you know, there is like a technical school up the street and like you can apply there. And I was like, not quite. And in some ways it felt like it has been just like me trying to be like, oh, I will, sh I will absolutely show you for like, you know, 12 years now. <laughs> I continue, like it continues to be like half of what fuels me is like this, this belief that people won't like trust that someone from my background from our background can achieve uh and it like seeds like horrible self-doubt that like carries on beyond achievement which i think is one of the most interesting things about becoming a physician of color in the united states is like it doesn't matter how much you like how good you get objectively like you have your papers and your degrees and your achievement and like at some point you like go and like ask for your final job as a transplant surgeon somewhere fancy and like there is still like that like little inkling of doubt of like oh but are they gonna say no like is this gonna be the time where like the effort is not gonna open that door for you um i thought i was gonna be an obstetrician because in colombia like a lot of the healthcare you have to deliver somewhere so the healthcare that i got to shadow in colombia even though it's like nothing like here was like most around like uh like mo mother and baby care in the countryside and and I love taking care of moms and I love taking care of babies and I was like I, that's totally what I'm gonna do so when I came to medical school I um um I like shadowed really early on I was like I need to meet my people find my passion and that lasted about 20 minutes in like a labor a busy labor and delivery ward in Chicago and I was like oh my god this is like what is going on this is totally not for me so I ran for the trees and then very serendipitously, I ended up matching on this like mentor, like a random mentoring system for M1s to like meet residents with a surgical resident at my, uh, at my program at, in Chicago. And he actually had spent some time in Michigan. He's my true Michigan connection and like the inception of the whole Michigan ordeal. But he like opened the, he was like, come shadowing clinic, like come to the operating room, like let me set you up with research. And he himself is from an underrepresented background. Uh, some of you might have met him. His name is Andrew Gonzalez. He was the, he was the senior vascular fellow, uh, graduated two years ago. But it like, it takes someone to do that for you. I, it almost feels like for some of the subspecialties because the push ever since I came to medical school was for like pursuit of primary care specialties where I felt that that's where I was gonna fit and, and do like the most good. Uh, and, and have the most uh, influence on like the outcomes and, and the health destiny of my community. So when I fell in love with surgery, I was like, well, this is complicated. Um, but I have been able to find like a group of people both like when I was training and then here in Michigan, they're like welcoming of like the version of, surger, of a surgeon that I want to become and that are open of thinking about ways in which like people can be surgeons that like don't come from what like you know the past 200 years of surgeons have come from um and at some point you know i i was set to intern like when he was a senior fellow and i like never thought i was i mean i and i had had exposure to transplant and i was like ah! did a whole sabai on it as a as a student and you know that just got me really early and now i'm like i'm just trained to try to become an abdominal transplant surgeon so it's cool Thanks, Val. That's, um, and thanks to you all for sharing those stories. It's like, it's interesting how there's threads between all of us in terms of how we get to this place, but it's also very different. You know, we all kind of get opportunities to be a part of medicine and get excited about it in different ways. The one thing I think that was a, um, that Val talked about that was important for me is that you start to meet people that inspire you to, um, uh, to go into whatever field it is you choose to be in, whether that's making a decision between medicine and surgery, um, you know, you you find you find a mentor or just you know 
anyone that you bump into that sort of embodies those ideals that that make you excited. And that's that's kind of how I got interested in transplant. So I found my way into surgery just because I liked the operating room and had some good mentors in vascular surgery. But transplant in particular is like, um, it's a pretty aggressive specialty, meaning it takes a lot of time in the, in the hospital. And uh, the, the emotional swings, which um, I know Val can speak to because she's written about, but the emotional swings when you are dealing with patients who are on death's doorstep, both, for, both positively, like you rescue them, but also negatively. And we have patients who, um, who die in the operating room and who die in the ICU afterwards. Um, so aligning yourself with, with people who, uh, who inspire you in those situations um, and are is such an important part of it. That's such an important part of um, what I do on a day to day. You know, my personal kind of mentor in this space from a research standpoint was Dr. Anglesby, um, who's one of our other transplant surgeons. And he inspired me from a really early age when I got to, um, as an intern, and that kind of got me interested. But Dr. Sonade is another one of our transplant surgeons here, and he trained at Johns Hopkins, and he has a particular way in which he has a passion for taking care of patients and a, a passion for preparation and a passion for communication with patients' families, which is a huge huge part of what transplant surgery is at the end of the day. We, you know, there's a lot of technical decisions to be made, but you develop these really intense relationships with the patient and their family because transplants are a scarce resource and you need to make sure that you, uh, you know the patients are gonna be good stewards for the organs. And so that necessitates a personal relationship with patients that is, I think, beyond, you know, fixing a hernia or taking out a gallbladder um, and, and really requires that uh, that deep relationship. Um, I I uh, I got to speak a little bit to the adrenaline that um, Gabriel was talking about earlier. Uh, transplant, um, if you can imagine, uh, is one of those specialties where you take your. My heart races every single time, and this is not an exaggeration. It still does, and I'm 37, and I've been doing this for a while. Uh, when I'm standing there and I make an incision to go into somebody's belly and find out what's going on, it almost always gives me butterflies. Um, when I uh, move the aorta around and get, get ready to put a cannula into it to flush the organs with cold solution, I get butterflies in my stomach every time. And those butterflies are the same things that you guys have been speaking to. It's, it's thinking about excellence in a field. And Jessica, I think you made some points to this. You, you, you found certain specialties because you develop a passion for being excellent in those specialties, for being excellent at anatomy, um, uh, and, and then being excellent when you get to medical school. Um, but that's what fuels me too, is, is every time I do an operation, I want to be excellent at it. And I think whether it was like hooking two pipes together as a plumber or hooking two blood vessels together as a transplant surgeon, that excellence is what, is what drives me on a day-to-day, -day. I want to bring back the perfect organ so my partner can do the perfect operation or vice versa. Um, and that, you know, that, that excellence, that desire for excellence is what drives, you know, your communication with families and your, your desire to give them your cell phone number so they can call you or text you when they have a problem. Um, and transplant really offers, offers that opportunity. So, but you get to do a lot of cool stuff. Um, so you get to fly in helicopters all the time, which is kind of crazy. Val, have you, got, have you flown in a helicopter yet? So that my month on, of, so I have, I have flown the plane and it, this was not, uh, this is not because I am unlucky. It's because my month on transplant, Dr. Remember, Dr. Inglesby was taking a bunch of call. So I remember yeah. clearly driving. Like, oh, that's right. I yeah. like the helicopter. <laughs> helicopter is, is super cool, but like helicopters, you're like literally like the world is behind your feet and you're like sitting there with your little helmet. So Dr. Anglesby, um, some of you guys have already met him. He's uh, Robert's uh, 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 league mentor. But he took a bunch of calls during my, uh, in January when I was the uh, PGY3 in transplant. Um, and we drove a lot. <laughs> but we also like talked about like research and life a lot too. We were on our way to like procure organs, which was very cool as well. <laughs> so not yet, but you know, I'll be back soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... And then, you know, that, so that's the adrenaline on the donor side, but then you get back with this organ. Um, and 
you take it out of ice and all of a sudden you, you clock's running and you're sweating and uh you know you you know that if like we did one last week i i i swear to you i have not had this much of a visceral response in a while but we were doing a um 71 year old gentleman with a with a dcd organ so a dcd means um donor after cardiac death it's like it's a it's a donor who's not brain dead but you have to kind of wait for them to expire and they cut the organs out really quick and so we get this organ back and i start taking out the old liver to put in the new liver and uh, it was very clear that as soon as I took the old liver out, the spot that I had to sew the liver into was this big. And as the intestines started to swell, that spot that I had to sew the liver into started going like this, um, even though I had things packed away because the blood was sort of welling up behind it. And I was trying to sew the vena cava, which was right at the bottom of this V. And I had to try to get it set up so Meredith could sew the portal vein. Man, my heart was racing. I was sweating. Um, and so that excitement that you guys feel in the operating room doesn't go away. Um, it, it still lives with me every single day in the operating room. And that sense of accomplishment, just like it is when you get done with a medical school test and you do well, or you, you know, finish helping and attending out with an operative case, it still like drives me every single day. And so, and I think that's because like, I, I love transplant. I love, what transplant offers. I have developed a relationship, you know, not every time, but most of the time with the families beforehand. So like, I, you sort of know what's at stake when you're doing this operation. And so I would encourage all of you, like, as you start to experience different fields of transplant, like pick that field that like gives you butterflies in your stomach when you start the operation, because you're excited to make the patient better and, and uh, to honor the gift of, of that opportunity to, you know, to operate on the patient. And um, I think that will become apparent to you. It will become apparent to you because you meet someone who inspires you to that field or um, because it means to, you know, means something to you. Like, you know, Gabriel talked about what it means, uh, means to him to be a part of gender reassignment surgery. And you'll find that thing that really gets you excited. And that's what drives you to wake up every morning at five o'clock and drive into the hospital, take care of the patients, deal with the kind of, you know, annoying things that go along with it. But it's really about finding that passion that's you know that's that's what makes me excited to come to the hospital every day you know sometimes like i think that surgery always gets a bad i mean in general like let's be honest surgery gets a bad rap and surgical is subspecialty sometimes sometimes you too because of the length of training and like the perceived uh, uh intensity of the training which like again i always feel like everybody should like take their specialty and go into things with eyes wide open i'm like the 80 hour rule was set because of us like we work like the 80 hours um, but it is like, I, like, I couldn't imagine, like, if you told me you have to do, like, you will get to work, you know, 30 hours a week or whatever normal people work doing something different, or you can, you know, get a little bit less sleep and then like have to like balance things a in a little bit more challenging way and like get to go. And, and this is, I mean, like, I don't get to do a kidney transplant every day or a liver transplant every day, like Seth does, but like, even at this stage of training, like. I just, I just like started out two months, a two year hiatus on, and I was tired and I'm still tired, but I did my last case. Like I, like I kept, I was counting like weeks before and I was tired and I was like working over hours and like operating overnight and like, you know, get called to operate on the night. And then like as a senior, you have to like drive to the hospital and then operate all day. So like you're tired, like it's nothing about exhaustion. But like nothing made me more apprehensive about my research time than knowing that I was going to spend like some prolonged period of time outside of the operating room, not taking care of patients in the way that I enjoy, not seeing them do well after operations. Um, and that, and like that feeling, I remember having it as a medical student because I finished my surgery residence, my surgery uh, rotation. And my surgery rotation was awesome, but it was like busy and like you all have that feeling. And I was, it was like right in the middle too. So I like, I still had things to see. And I remember I was, I did it all at the VA and I was walking out after like helping on the last operation. I was like, you know what, if I like don't do surgery, that was like the very last time that I ever probably saw the inside of an operating room. Like I could spend the rest of my life doing something else. And that thought was unbearable. I was like, what do you mean that I don't get to go back to the operating room? I was like, that sounds horrible. And that feeling of like wanting this by being tired or like having challenges because everything, every specialty is challenging um like wanting to do something for the joy and the pleasure for yourself and for like the joy of helping others um like it will never lead you astray 
like making decisions of specialty is hard making decisions of subspecialty is hard too like it, there's a lot of things that go into deciding what you're going to do with the rest of your life and like surgery is long and like it requires additional training sometimes and but so do other things and so if it like what makes your RV faster is to like do pediatric endocrinology or like transplant livers and kidneys for a living it's like it's truly worth it and he makes it so that like like it, work is not work like you can work you, you won't work a day of your life if you're doing what you love mm -hmm. yeah it's so it's so necessary um because of you know what you have to sacrifice sometimes so i you know i i talk about how much i love transplant but it you know it also it also comes with some sacrifices and you you know um you know, all, all of you have talked about your family and how, you know, they're an important part of your life, um, whether it be sort of the impetus to get into surgery or being a part of that impetus to get into surgery. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, there will be some sacrifices and you'll have to sacrifice some time and some availability for a period of time um, to do that. And I think that's magnified a little bit with transplant surgery because it's, you know, when, it, when an organ's available, it's available and you kind of got to go, got to go do it. But, but as Val was saying, if you, if you love that field and your family sees that you love that field and you give it, you give it your passion, um, you know, at least my family's been very understanding the whole time to know that, you know, they're a part, they're a part of that too. Their, their sacrifice of, of my time and availability is, is also sort of their, you know, their ability to give back and, and help patients as well. Um, so I think that's, that's an important part of it too. Uh, Val asked to talk about my research a little bit, and um, you know I, we don't have to get into specifics, but I think it's important as you start to develop an interest in whatever field in surgery you want to go into, um, asking those questions. And um, you know, Jessica said, like, what makes you mad? What what gets you frustrated? That's such an important thing. And as you as you start to move through, um, you I want you all to to think about. Uh, you know, is it is it disparities in healthcare that get you uh, angry? Is it um, uh, is it you know geographic differences in access to transplant surgery? Is it uh, you know whatever whatever that is? Um, seek out someone who's got a similar interest and engage them in some conversations about it. Try to get involved. Um, Robert's been joining us on our tree meeting, so if um, Priscilla and Gabriel Gracia, if you guys want to join our tree meetings too, we would love to have you. Um, be you know be a part of our research community as well, um, but but try to find people with similar interests that um, that get you excited about the projects and and find something that you're angry about because that really drives the passion too. Um, what? How do you go about uh, like? There's a lot of things that make people angry, and I think that like especially like the more that you train and go to medical school and you like see things that even not working well or patients not receiving the care that they need, that there is like a spectrum of things that you can pursue or not pursue. Like, how do you go about, let's say in the residency before ADT uh, academic development time about figuring out what you wanted to spend some time in um, research wise? Yeah, I think you have to be educated in it. So spend some time, um, reading textbooks, reading the literature a little bit, you know, subscribe to uh, the Twitter feeds from all of the major kind of journals so you can keep up with what's going on. And so when you do have the opportunity to meet someone in a field that you're interested in, you can start off with an educated conversation about a topic that you're passionate about. So, you know, um, I can say, Val, how do you feel about, um, you know, this topic or that topic? And she, she will have um, you know, she'd have a great response to that because she, you know, she lives in that world and she's thought about it too. And that shows those people that you interact with that you're, that you're really interested in it as well. So I think um, coming up with something that you are interested in and then educating yourself in it. And then when the opportunity arises, when you see that person or you're in that place where there's someone who has a similar opportunity, who's a level above you, like a resident or, or the attending, you say, hey, I've really read about this. I'm really interested in it. What do you think of this? And that can often be a, a launch point for a relationship with that person going forward because they'll see that you're um, that you've spent the time to, you know, educate yourself about it. They'll see that you have a passion in that, and that can sometimes, you know, spin its way all the way up to um, that person being a mentor or you know influencing your 
career path in some way. I've always been a big fan of like working hard off the court. So when you step on the court and you get that one shot, you, uh, you, I've been listening to a lot of Hamilton this week. Um, but when you get that shot, you don't want to waste your shot. You know, you want to take it. Are you sure you weren't watching Dr. Inglesby's video? Yeah, for sure. I forgot about that. I didn't, I didn't say it for that reason, of course, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's like, they always say you're, you know, uh, it's, you know, they talk about being lucky or being good. Um, and, you know, I, I think the more you work hard, that those lucky opportunities really turn out to be, um, you know, a big deal for sure. Um, and, you know, I, you guys have inspiring stories about how you worked your way to medicine. You know, I certainly um, didn't have, you know, like, I didn't have a friend that sort of like gave me a, put in a good word for me or anything. It was about, for me, it was about, you know, taking the best opportunity at, in those critical junctures and like um, sticking my neck out there a little bit. And I think all of you, all of you have the skills to do the same thing for yourself when you see that opportunity. Anybody else has any questions for Dr. Waits? Um, I just have some curiosity. Um, I feel like oh, yes. organ, organ transplant specialty might be the only one that in your job description requires you to be like in a helicopter. Like how do you overcome like height, like phobias and stuff like that? <laughs> oh, that's great. So I have a good story about that. I, the first few donors I did as a resident, maybe like, a third year resident. I was all excited because I thought I want to be a transplant surgeon. And um, we went to the operating room, did all the stuff, put the ice in the body. I stuck my hands in and I had a really bad vasovagal. So I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't faint, but I think my heart rate probably went down to the thirties and I got lightheaded. And then it happened over and over and over again. Um, and so for a while I thought like, can I really do this? This is, it's sort of important to be able to like do things in ice when you're a transplant. Because surgeon. of the ice? Yeah. I mean, I was like scared that I was going to pass out, you know, and it was a really like significantly scary situation because I could feel it coming every single time. Um, just like the helicopter, I was sort of scared of the, <laughs> scared of the ice for a while. Um, but Robert, I sort of evaluated the situation and started to decide what it was about that situation that scared me. Um, and then I tried to think of ways to like mitigate the situation. So uh, yeah, Gracia says it's super cold. You're totally right, Gracia, it's ridiculously cold. So um, I started watching other people um, and other people would stick their hands in, do what they needed to do, get their hands out and then wipe their hands off with, with a laparotomy sponge or a towel. So then I started doing that. Then I started feeling better about it. The next few I did in vasovagal, I started to, lose that tendency to be scared of it. So I think the same as like being in a helicopter with a fear of heights, you have to sort of see how other people handle it. And uh, if you really want to do it, you will figure out a way around that for sure. Like similar things will happen like when you're like as a student too, like in this, this doesn't necessarily need to be like, you no, know, you're like scared of something or like having a response to something like maybe something doesn't go right. So like things won't go right. Like you will mess up in a presentation. You will like cut the like cut the tails too long or too short or whatever they're doing nowadays. They're always too long. Uh, and then you'll be like, oh my god, this is like this was the moment that I was supposed to like like obviously not meant to do X like be a doctor, be a surgeon. Like, and I think that this like thought that like everybody is just like perfectly suited for whatever their like final destination is is a myth and it's like a myth that is perpetuated in medicine and surgery by like the giants like I mean not even like it literally just like I remember like trying to think about like how like my chief residents were doing things and I was like I have no idea how I, I will ever get there and like obviously mess up the list this morning so that means that I'm not met for anything good <laughs> and the truth is that like there is a lot of overcoming in like medicine and surgery and like taking some of those like adversities whatever they are that you're vasovagaling to blood or ice or that you made a mistake and now you feel that the next time you're gonna make a mistake again. There's a lot of like psychology that goes on on like trying to like stop psyching yourself out from things uh, for lack of a better word. I, there have definitely been times that in the operating room I have done something wrong or something terribly wrong and I'm like, 
okay, so this is definitely, am I incredibly superstitious person? So I was like, this is, this is just going to happen again and again. And like the mental gymnastics of like talking yourself out of like, you know, not thinking that you can achieve or not thinking that something is going to go well again, or thinking that because you can do something or you're not a natural, like grabbing a needle driver and just going around and like selling things really fast that that means that you're not destined for, for something. Totally true. My, uh, my brother-in-law, who he probably wouldn't mind me saying this, um, is an excellent ER physician. He went to Indiana University, which is like a top ER program, and he's a faculty now. He's great. Um, he went to University of Toledo for medical school, and uh, he was in the ER on his first day, and uh, they were putting in a central line. And he's like 6'3", 220, played, high, played college football. Like he's, you know, he's a big dude. He, they poked the skin with the needle, and boom, straight to the ground. Like, uh, do not pass go, passed out just super fast. Um, and now he like, you know, does crikes and uh, puts in chest tubes and puts in central lines. It's just, it's about like, if you have a passion for something, you will get over that fear, you will get over that failure if it happens. Um, just keep driving forward. Any other questions? I have a curiosity question. Um, sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so backstory, my uncle, my mom's brother, passed away a few years ago at age like 50 um, with cirrhosis. Um, he, they live in Guatemala. Um, he, I guess, like had an adverse reaction to some medication that is not allowed in the United States, but that he was prescribed. And so he went into liver failure and eventually passed away. So that's a backstory. Um, but so anyway, so when I told my mom I was doing a rotation at transplant surgery, she was super interested because when her brother um, went into liver failure, he was told that like the only way for him to survive was to get a new liver, which like clearly didn't happen. And which like in a country like Guatemala with a generally shitty, uh, sorry, oops, this is gonna be on the internet. A generally bad <laughs> healthcare system, um, unless you're extremely wealthy, like that was never gonna happen. Um, but so, anyways, I was curious about like, um, like what are what like residency criteria, I guess, like exist for someone to be listed in a certain place. Um, like, do you know about that? Because I, I guess, like in retrospect, I'm like, huh, like I wonder if. You know, I wonder if he could have, you know, moved and lived with my family in Connecticut and maybe been listed in the States. I don't know if you have any information about that. Yeah, we actually just talked about this at a tree meeting a couple of weeks ago, so I can throw some stats at you. Um, you we are required by law not to do more than it was 2% or 4% of your total transplant volume from, um, from uh, patients who have immigrated to the United States and are not citizens. Hmm. So there's a cap. But guess what there's not a cap on? And that is patient, you know, patients who have, who become brain dead, who have um, immigrated to the United States and are not citizens. There's no cap on what percentage of those can be um, organ donors. So there's this imbalance of hmm. contributing organs, but not reaping the same benefits um, in return, which is you know, a travesty. Um, so yeah, I think Gracia, if your uncle would have moved here, it is totally possible that he could have gotten a liver transplant. Oh. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you for sharing. I was just, I've been curious about that and like yeah. the opportunity to ask never came up during the rotation. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Super interesting and, and really kind of sad for sure. Um, you should look at the numbers, Gracia, of like, I, sometimes I'm like, we are like, you no. Know, Taking, like looking at like who's transplanting and I'm like you know thinking about fellowship and I was like how many livers like I need to go to a place that's like high volume and then I think this just speaks to like the amount of time that I have lived in the states that like at some point I was like I'm like how does transplant look somewhere else and I looked at the numbers especially for like south like central and south america of how many organs are transplanted sorry for like the arrival of my dog she's very needy uh central and south american countries and it's like in the single digits sometimes, which is like, you no, know, there is celebrations around like being able to like, you know, do 15 liver transplants in a country in a year. 
and I and like I mean the, there is diabetes and high blood pressure and liver failure and alcoholism and NASH and like the obesity epidemic has like reached every country on earth and it's it's wild to me like what access to transplantation looks like in other places. It is uh it and 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 Gracia to what you spoke about earlier with sort of the need for not a surgeon just pop in, do some stuff and leave, which is what the usual kind of, um, you know, I guess humanitarian mission is, but transplant requires a longitudinal, mm -hmm. um, you can't just transplant someone and then leave them, leave them be because there's mm -hmm. a, a ton of bad things that happen and immunosuppression and um, long-term graft dysfunction and things like that. So Dr. Punch, who's one of my partners, um, traveled, travels to Ethiopia and does kidney transplants. And he's been doing that for like three or four years now. And they've transplanted a whole bunch of people, but he, he's been teaching the surgeons to do it and, and teaching the nephrologists how to manage the patient. I think that's how you build a sustainable program in a place where they don't have those resources at, at hand at this time. And certainly sounds like there's a huge need for that. Yeah, I enjoyed talking to him about that in the OR. I think that's yeah. Super. So. Yeah, he's he's great. Did he also tell you about how he had like a heart attack while he was operating there and had to get TPA from Dubai? He loves to tell the story. So have to oh my goodness, yeah. had to get TPA oh. from Dubai. Yeah, it, it's like it's the craziest story ever. So um, <laughs> it's it, insulin surgeons are hard. Much adrenaline. <laughs> yes, yes, adrenaline like crazy. <laughs> Um, Seth, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Um, it was awesome to hear about how you came into transplant. I always love to hear the story. I know this guy is love to hear it too. Um, hopefully you will see a lot, like a lot, whole lot of Robert and maybe from the rest of us, a tree, we can ever make it. Um, yeah. and, uh, if, if, if it's okay, I will share your contact information with the scholars in case they have oh. any Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the pleasure is all mine to be here, and um, please reach out to me. I would love to, uh, you know, talk to you guys about anything you want to talk about. And uh, you know, thanks for the opportunity, Val. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, see you later. See ya.